Hi, I've missed you. We need to talk. Welcome and welcome back, everybody. Tia here. And as you already know, you saw it in the thumbnail, you saw it in the title. Today, I'm going to be burning and calling some games. Something about being on break. I was thinking, you know, I'll come back refreshed, calm, peace, sound of mind. And instead, I reorganized my games and thought every third game, gotta go get this garbage out of my house. <laughs> and let's be honest, y'all are here for it. I'm good for it. This is the chaotic energy we've been missing from our lives for how long now at this point? So this is as good as it gets. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Today I wanted to just take you through each of the games, talk a little bit about why it will be leaving my collection. Some of these games are really great games, fantastic, excellent titles, but for one reason or another, they're just not clicking with me and what I need in my life right now. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to just start with this beautiful stack in front of me. So this top game here, unfortunately, is a Jordan Draper game called Tokyo Metro with the Osaka Metro expansion. Um, I love Jordan Draper's games. I think he's a fantastic designer. He seems like a really cool person. I bought this game with the intention of playing it, but if I'm being honest, I'm just not big into train games, not big into economy types of games. So unfortunately, this is one that's a little bit chunkier than some of his other titles and doesn't really fit with my personal taste and what I'm looking for in my collection right now. Next up, we have Cat Sudoku, which is by Tate Wu. Again, big fan of his, love the art from Hayami. But this particular game, I'm not that great at. And as far as roll and writes go, it doesn't give me a full Sudoku feel. It doesn't give me a full roll and write feel. Another one in the similar vein of things is Tyrannosaurus's Holiday. Tyrannosaurus is a cat and it's, this is a rule and write about him entertaining his cat and puppy friends while his owners are away. It's super cute. I love the packaging and that it looks like a little package that's been torn up by cats. I think the theming is really cool, but for a roll and write, it's just super light and I honestly haven't played it much since I've gotten it. So I think it'll find a much better home where it'll be better loved elsewhere. Mining Colony is a game um, from Dr. Steve Finn. This one had a solo mode that I was really interested in trying. It's a weird in-between of not being super light. There's quite a bit of setup with the different tiles and components. And unfortunately, it's not like chunky enough to give me a really satisfying feeling. So it's kind of a weird mid-weight game for a tile placement resource-ish management game. Then we have Barbarian Battlegrounds. This game is super cute, but it is a programming combat game. So there is a lot of targeting of other people and programming your moves and revealing them all at once gives me a lot of anxiety. So it's I'm really hard pressed to find a game that I enjoy playing with that particular mechanic. And although the theme and art and components and everything of this one are great, it's one that I haven't really whipped out that often. Gopi is another one that's absolutely gorgeous. This is another tile placement game, but it's very light. It's very simple on its set collection, kind of route building with your camels, placing them down on different tiles. And although it's absolutely gorgeous and I would love to keep it for just that, if I'm being honest, it's not one that I'm going to really be playing that often with other tiling games in my collection. Now, this next one really pains me, but we have Dark Souls the card game with all of the expansions. Now, if y'all know, I am a huge fan of Dark Souls. There is no IP out there that I love more. But again, if I'm being honest, this game does a really great job of capturing some of the beauty and some of the nature of the games. It's a cooperative card game, which is pretty cool. However, it's just fiddly. And if I want to interact with Dark Souls, I'm probably going to end up playing the video games. I do have the board game as well with all of the miniatures. And again, quite fiddly, but at least they have beautiful minis. I wanted to keep this for the art and for the collection, but I never take the cards out of the box. I never get to display them. I never get to look at them. I have the freaking art books. If I want to see Dark Souls art, I'll just do that or play the game. Um, this is a really solid card game if you're into heftier card games, if you're into cooperative card games, but it's hard for me to sit at a table cooperatively with just cards for that long. I know like LCG style campaign games are really a big thing that a lot of people will enjoy. And if you love Dark Souls and you love that style of game, definitely check this one out. But for me, it's not a style of game that I really enjoy. And so I'm very sadly having to let this one go. Um, the next game on the list here should look familiar. It is Glow. Beautiful art from Ben Basso. I think this is a great family weight game. Um, but it's very samey from play to play. I know there's the second board that you can utilize, but 
for me, it's just kind of a really simple back and forth, and it didn't offer me a lot of depth of strategy or reward in terms of that. It's more so just enjoying it for the aesthetic. Next one is Winterborn. Um, this is one that's really unique, and... It's one that if I had more plays with it, or maybe if I tried the solo play, I might feel differently about it, but unfortunately, again, it's a weird middle in between of being kind of tight, but not super tight. You can get lots of resources. I'm not really sure. The game feels a little bit off for me with its pacing, and I love the power-up in the last season, but the first three seasons take so long to get there and feel a little bit more arbitrary. So this is one that I probably won't be playing over other similar games in my collection. Next up is Topiary. Um, so this is kind of a little puzzly game where you're going to be creating line of sight with different meeples to score different topiaries and arranging them around. It's a really cute game, but again, it's a weird midweight where if I want to turn my brain off, this has a little bit too much brain burning, but if I want to play something really satisfying, the mechanics and the depth and the replayability with this one don't really satisfy that. Reef is a gorgeous production. It's a really cool set collection game. This is a great family game, but when I have other games with beautiful tiles and similar weights like Dragon Castle or even just Azul, I feel like those get to the table way more than Reef does. I do have like the mini expansion with the little fish that eat the coral, which I thought was really cool, but not cool enough for me to be playing it regularly. And then we have Portal, the uncooperative cake acquisition game. I'm a big Portal fan. I love the IP, but um, yeah, this game was really interesting in how it implements its mechanics. It's a little bit different than anything I've ever seen where you're traveling down the board, zapping yourself through portals, collecting cake. It's a really cool concept, but the gameplay itself isn't for me. I think if you're a fan of Portal and you're a fan of board games, this is a great one. But um, for me, I'm looking for something a little bit more in depth. And again, like, the IP is cool to see in a board game form, but unless it's integrated in a way that feels really unique and special to where I would play the board game, even if it was a different theme, it's probably not going to be staying in my collection. Next up over here, we have Llama Land, um, one of the newer Phil Walker Harding games with touch amino pieces and stacking. So this game gets lumped in a lot of times with Baron Park and Gingerbread House. If you guys have been around, you know that I absolutely love gingerbread house it is one of my most played games weirdly enough um and i do really enjoy baron park as well especially with the monorails expansion llama Land kind of combines both of those where you have the tetramino tiles that you would have in baron park and you also have vertical stacking like you would in gingerbread house so i thought cool and there are these llamas it's really interesting there's a little engine building with different cards that you can get but this game just feels empty to me. I don't know. Something about collecting four of the exact same type of resource and trading them in for a llama before anyone else. And yes, there are variable scoring objectives that you can go for, but it didn't feel like a big enough part of the game. Um, it didn't feel like there was as much variability. And again, I know that there is variability. For some reason, this one just didn't click with me like Baron Park and Gingerbread House do. And I've given it quite a few plays at this point. Um, and unfortunately, it just not doing it. And we have New York Zoo from Louis Rosenberg. This is a beautiful game. Really cool animal meeples. That was one of the reasons I was drawn to it. I love Arctic foxes and they are in this game. However, if I'm being honest, again, I love tetraminos, polyaminos, but this game is just, I don't know. It's another zoo game where you're making pairs, you're populating tiles, you're getting more stuff. It kind of reminds me of Zoo Loretto, but with such amino pieces instead of just tiles. And Zoo Loretto, Colorado, those set collection games are a lot quicker and to the point than New York Zoo was for me. I think this is a really cool game if you like the concept of it and you like Tetraminos. It's not a bad game at all. It's just that there are other polyamino games that I would rather play or there are other park building games that I would rather play. Next up is Montana. So this game I had pre-ordered the expansions for forever ago and they're still not here. It's been years. I heard almost nothing about it and honestly it just kind of pisses me off. In addition to that, when I first played this game at 2, I fell in love with it. I've played it since then with 3 or 4, and the endgame condition is kind of a weird trigger. I feel like there are other games that do that better. Next one is Cargo Noir, which is a um, classic Days of Wonder game. This one is mostly a bidding game. It's a little bit lighter, family weight game. I got it for the collection because it's been out of print, and I found a good price for it, but I haven't played it since I purchased it. So it's got to go, especially because it takes up quite a bit of space. Now, before y'all get mad, I know some of you have probably seen it and are already fuming. Maybe you've clicked out of this video already. I don't know. But Spirit Island, 
with the expansions, I enjoy this game, but it is a lot to get into. And with the way that my collections are, I'm not the kind of person that's going to sit there and play a game 40, 50, 60 times. I like variety. I like spice of life. This is one that's hard to get into with other people too who have never played it because there's so much going on and you really have to dedicate multiple plays to get a lot out of it. This is one that I have played solo a couple of times and it was interesting, but there are so many rules and every time I sit down, I feel like I have to constantly look things up, which isn't necessarily a bad thing if you're willing to invest the plays, but I'm not. I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. I'd rather play a couple different games and see some new stuff. And there's a lot of variability within the game with the different spirits, with the expansions and how you play it. And I know that, but unfortunately for me, this one is just compared to some of my other favorites. It's a little too convoluted and there's a little bit too much reliance on knowing the game versus understanding the rules and then building strategies as you go on, like knowing the different cards, knowing the different spirits, how they interact with each other. That comes from multiple plays. And that's not something that you can abstract away from the game um, and just like use your own brain power. You just have to put in the work to learn all of those things. And for me, that's not really something that attracts me to games. In fact, it's a little bit of a turnoff. So I think this will definitely get more playtime in someone else's collection. Yukon Airways is a gorgeous pick up and deliver game. Um, it's got some clean engine building. I don't know. It just felt very samey for me. It really reminded me of Covert by King Klinko. And that is probably one of my favorite pick up and deliver games. But there's a little bit more going on with the different items that you get. This one's a little bit more straightforward and there's some dice. I mean, I don't know. It wasn't my favorite. Next up, we have Isle of Cats with all of the expansions and everything. And this one makes me a little sad. Um, so the thing about Kickstarters is that I get very allergic to games that have too much for a very simple game. This is one of those games where when I got the base game and I got later rivals, I thought, wow, this is great. This is it. And then they started adding like there were the promo packs and now there's the kittens and all this stuff. And although the little kitties are super, super cute, it just gives me a bad feeling to have this very simple game loaded with all of these different things and I'm sure that for fans of the game that's great they want more content that's awesome they're willing to produce it they're willing to pay for it I don't know I just have a hard time being a part of that unfortunately so this one will not be staying in my collection but again I know I'm going to be able to find a really good home for it where it's going to get a lot of play time and really be appreciated and get to the table versus just sitting on my shelf and this is this is a big heavy box it's not like it's uh, there's not a lot of free real estate here so i have to be honest with myself and think about the value of this game versus purchasing multiple other games that i would be able to play much more continuing on we have some smaller box games here let's take a hike this was a really cool little card game but Again, I haven't played it. I have plenty of other card games that I would play instead. The next one is Rebel Knox. Unfortunately, this is part of the Capital Lux universe. I know it is a social deduction, hidden role kind of game where you're on teams that change throughout the game. It sounds really cool, but it is a little bit convoluted and it's not a style of game that I play very often. When I do, we have our go-tos like Ku and other classics in that style of thing. So. This one, unfortunately, will be leaving. Bobiakawa is just a little betting game. I don't know. I really love teal and I love red and I love the combination. It's got just a minimal aesthetic, but the game is also very minimal and I honestly haven't played my copy ever. Mini Rogue. This one is a little sad. Um, I originally encountered Mini Rogue as a nine card print and play. I loved it. I thought that the use of the minimal components was so ingenious in how they resolved that. When they did the Kickstarter, I backed it instantly, but there's just too much stuff now. And there's more stuff, but they didn't expand on the mechanics in any sort of unique way. So now they took this really condensed down, pure kind of idea and expanded it out. And it's just doesn't feel as inventive for me. It just felt a little more generic with the bigger size box with everything in it, unfortunately. The Cup Bad Cop is another hidden roll game with teams. And again, I just don't play it much compared to some of my other games um, of that type. Narashima Convoy. I have Narashima Hacks. I love it. I'm not exactly sure what this is. This was kind of gifted to me. 
and it looks like a card game version of Nurmashima Hex. I would probably just rather play Nurmashima Hex. Crossfire, another social deduction kind of game with hidden goals. Y'all know why I'm not keeping that. Quest is in the similar line of things. It has art from Lovers in Santiago, so I was really hopeful. It's basically like the Resistance in Avalon, but reskinned and updated a little bit. Again, I just don't have the groups for those games, and we have our go-tos. <laughs> this one is really sad. Demeter. Okay. I love Sorry We Are French. I love Ganymede. This is a roll and write in the same universe with absolutely freaking gorgeous art. It's about cultivating dinosaurs on the moon. And I don't know. You're just filling in bubbles. There's a tiny, tiny bit of engine building. It's not as combo-y as Gunshun Clever or any of those games. It's not as expansive and creative as something like Cartographers or Railroad Inc. And this one just really fell flat for me. I had high hopes because of the publisher, because of the arts, because of the um, universe that it comes from, but it just, no, I can't. <laughs> I'll never play it again because it was just unsatisfying. We have Planet Defenders. This is a really cool little kind of pick up and deliver game, um, but compared to Century, what is it? Eastern Wonders, the one with the boats. This has a very similar feel, but it's very streamlined down. I think this would be a great game for a family game or for people who enjoy lighter games. Bucket King 3D. So I have Pick a Polar Bear and Pick a Seal. I love the art. I love the universe of those games. I like these silly little speed dexterity kinds of games, but this one you're actually stacking physical buckets and playing hands of cards and then flicking out the buckets. It was really fun. I had a lot of <laughs> I had a lot of fun trying it out, but again, I think there's probably a family out there with kids that will be able to play this game and have way more laughs than I will. It was a novelty item. I'm glad I got to try it, and now I'm going to be passing it on. King of Tokyo. I know this is a standard, but I don't know. It is what it is. It's a game. People like it. That's fine. It's not for me. This like punch them up, take that kind of thing you know, take it or leave it. It's just plenty of people will enjoy that in their collection much more than I will. So kind of the same thing with Boomtown Bandits. I love the speed aspect of rolling dice and stealing treasures from each other. It feels pretty thematic. It's like a cool Western theme. The art is pretty nice, but I'm never going to play it again. It's not a style of game that really appeals to me. It's pretty much kind of in the same vein of King of Tokyo, if I'm being honest, where you're like rolling dice, collecting sets, etc., trying to get points. I don't know. And I'm just gonna slide these over here. So we have another fat stack of games. Wizard Wanted is a really cool pickup and deliver game from Mattel. Because it's Mattel games, they have absolutely exceptional component quality, but I'm not a huge fan of pickup and deliver. This one, like there's a little too many things going on for it to be an easy sit down and play game, but it's not chunky enough in its strategy to warrant the playtime and all of the rules, so that one will be leaving. Spirits of the Rice Paddy is a cool farming style game. I got the Soul expansion for it as well, but I've just never gotten to try that. I'm not big on farming games. This one didn't have anything that really stood out to me. There were some unique mechanics with how like water works and getting it into your rice paddies, but there was nothing special that really gripped me. Juicy Fruits. I really like the sliding mechanic, but it is kind of samey after a while. I would love to see that same mechanic implemented into a heavier style, like Euroway type game as a little mini game that you can play. But for this one, it was just very basic. Collect your resources, turn them in, just back and forth, back and forth. So there's not a really cool game arc there that kept me engaged throughout the game and that made me want to come back and play it over and over again. Lord of the Rings, the card game. I love Lord of the Rings. Speaking of IPs, um, the art in this game is absolutely gorgeous as well. But it is a living card game. And as you all know, that's not really my thing. Story-based games. I just can't get my brain to calm down enough to focus on playing a game that many times repeatedly back to back. And although I love Lord of the Rings, although I love the art, although I think the gameplay and the implementation in this one is really good, it's not one that I'm going to be playing, if I'm being honest. Apotheca is an interesting one. There's a couple different modes, like one versus all, free for all modes. It's interesting because you're using different characters to move around the board in different patterns, which I typically really like. But if I want something like that, I'm probably going to play at like two player light game Robin of Loxley that's super quick. 
Or if I'm gonna go the other direction, then I'm probably gonna go with something like Tash Kalar, where you have those patterns that you're making out on the board in order to like destroy appointments. Um, again, this one's just kind of a weird in-between that I don't see myself playing that often. Paris New Eden has one of my favorite themes, which is post-apocalyptic jungle theme, which is like a really weird specific theme of game to own that I realized I have quite a few of. This one has dice, it's well produced, it's interesting enough, but not enough over the other two games that I have um, in this line of games of a similar weight, of a similar, I guess maybe not similar weight, but with a similar feel overall to them, which would be Outlive and the Boldest. Um, so this one is the lowest on the list, unfortunately, and it will be leaving. Santorini is an interesting abstract game. It's another one of those that's pretty standard. There are some people that will absolutely love and play the crap out of this game, and this is just not for me. I think at two, it's fine, but it can go kind of back and forth, samey samey. And if I want an abstract game, I just want a pure abstract. Like, give me Yinch, give me Zert. This one doesn't get played. Then we have The Forgotten City. This one is pretty interesting. I think if the art was different, I mean, this cover art is gorgeous, but the actual board itself and everything, not the nicest to look at, unfortunately. I think if this had a um, more beautiful presentation, I would be willing to give it more plays. The next one really sucks. <laughs> Stronghold Undead. I spent forever trying to track down a cheap copy of Stronghold 2nd Edition, and by the time I did, they announced Stronghold Undead. So I thought, I'll just wait, because I would love to play Stronghold just now with like zombies and everything. But it's a two-player game. It's a siege-style game where one player is holding down the fort, <laughs> literally, and the other player is um, playing hordes of monsters coming in and trying to ravage them. I mean, it really gives me the same vibes as Battlemaster, which is one of my all-time favorite games growing up. However, there's a lot here. I hardly have time or hardly have the opportunity to play games at just two. And when I do, it's tricky because I have so many two-player games that I love and want to play all the time that are lighter, um, that are easy to get to the table, and it's hard to justify whipping out something big and chunky like this. And similarly, if I want to play a bigger, chunkier game at two, I can play one of the games that plays up to four, or plays up to five, or plays more than two players, and I'll get more variability and more playtime out of it because of that. So unfortunately, I haven't gotten to play Stronghold. I haven't even played Stronghold Undead, and I just don't see myself putting in the effort to learn it and play it because I know that there are very few opportunities where I'll be able to even get it to the table if I do. Imperial Settlers, um, since then, we have like the Empires of the North series. This one is another kind of standard engine building game. It just didn't appeal to me as much as some other games which incorporate engine building in slightly different ways. The idea of building a civilization isn't a theme that really appeals to me very much to begin with. And although this is a standard, there's a lot of stuff for it. There's a lot of variability. I don't know. It's just one that didn't leave a solid impression on me one way or the other. I'm like, wow, this is pretty well designed. It's pretty interesting. There's a lot of stuff you can do, but it didn't strike me in any single way that made me feel like, yeah, I need this game in my collection. So unfortunately, I haven't played it very much since I've gotten it and it's just time to move on. All right, getting down to it. Ooh, <laughs> okay. So we have O oh, Captain. This is from the Legends of Luma universe. I am a huge fan of Nomads, which is from the universe as well. That one, I believe, though, is designed by Gary Kim. This is from Florian Sirix. I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, this is a really cool bluffing game. I think for kids, the universe is really awesome. The characters are super cool. The mechanics for this one are very straightforward, but again, I have a lot of bluffing games with set collection that I will be playing instead of this one, so it has to go. The Rat Catcher. I know I said in my previous video of 50 games in 50 days that this is one that I was interested to delve more into. Since then, I haven't. Spoiler alert. Um, and again, the fiddliness of it. I know there have been some rules updates post Kickstarter to clean some things up, but even then, my thought is there are other solo games that I would rather play that are much cleaner, much more streamlined. And although I love the aesthetic and the components and everything, it's just not happening. Periodic. This is a really cool one. Again, in theme, I think this would be a great family game. This one didn't do much for me, although I do um, love Genius Games games. Genius Games is games. <laughs> um, this one is not one that I'll be holding on to. 
And we have Tyler Singman's Crows. This is an update from Crows. I love the art of this game. It was really cool, like just moving around set collection, tiling, I don't know. It's a lot of those basic mechanics that don't really speak to me that have been done in many other games. And this one does it just in a very basic way with a cool aesthetic. Unfortunately, I can't just keep it just because it's an okay game with really nice artwork. Speaking of nice games with gorgeous artwork, we have Vivid Memories. I know that this one was pretty popular when it came out and it has a similar weight and feel as like Azul or other games like that or Splendor for sure. I don't know. This one hurts my brain <laughs> when you're linking your memories on your main player board and not in like a great way. The rest of the game is so light and it's so quick. The pacing feels a little bit off for me. It's I, I tend to lean towards short, tight games, but this one is just a little too short, I guess. It doesn't feel fulfilling. And again, the game arc doesn't really progress as you're going through, like you can get bigger connections, but you're doing the same thing from each round to round. And overall, that thing doesn't feel super satisfying. So Cupcake Empire is a really cool game. I liked it a lot more than I thought I would. I think that unfortunately, the art and aesthetic of the game and the meeples kind of put me off a little bit. I think it's a cool theme, don't get me wrong, but overall the game was better than I thought it would be, but not good enough to keep around. Then we have Sky Traders. This is another pick up and deliver game. Um, this one has some issues with colorblind friendliness, which is a little iffy. Um, it's a bit fiddly. It kind of reminds me a lot of Jamaica, but with an airship theme instead of just a ship theme. I think if I have a group, we would probably play Jamaica instead. Even though it's a racing game and not a pick up and deliver, there are a lot of similar things with like having cargo holds in your ship and getting from place to place and delivering things. It's just one that I haven't played in literally years. So we're getting rid of it. We have Godspeed from Pandasaurus Games. This one is really well produced. I like a lot of Pandasaurus's titles. Unfortunately, this one is not one of the ones that really stood out to me. It's a solid game with solid mechanics, but there's not a lot that's really novel or unique here um, in terms of like other games that I've seen. And I'm not a huge fan of space themed games or again, expand, like building out an empire, kind of establishing a space colony. That whole thing doesn't appeal to me super much. Aquarion is like dark high fantasy, pretty straightforward. It's a lot lighter than I thought it would be based on the box art and the description of the game. I played it when I first got it like once or twice and I haven't played it since then. It's a big box. It's got to go. Alrighty, and our, we have our last but not least little pile here. So I'm very sad to be letting go of Claim and all the little mini expansions, at least the ones we have here in the US so far. Um, this is a two-player tricky taking game from Scott Alms, although you can play it with up to four now. This is another one that when the first box came out with a few factions, I thought, wow, cool, clever. And then they just kept making more and more and more and more and promos and a big box. and Again, that kind of puts me off of a game. I like things to just be how they are. I'm a little bit of a minimalist. I'm not against it. I understand that people want more of the things that they like. And if you can do that with like different factions and things, then why not? You're making content for the industry. People are making money. People are making good memories with the games. But um, yeah, it's just a little too much for me at this point. And there are other two player games and even other two player trick team games that I would rather play instead. Floor pan is a big bummer. I love the idea of creating blueprints. It's something I used to do for fun as a child. Once we did it like for one math class, I just would doodle blueprints for fun. I don't know. Is that weird? <laughs> so when they made a rule and write about it, I was like, ooh, exciting. But as far as rule and rights go, again, cartographers and railroading. If you're drawing stuff, putting stuff on a map, if it doesn't live up to those standards, it's not going to be staying on my shelves. So there's that. Although I heard there's a sequel coming out where you have two levels. We'll look into it and see what that brings. But the base game one, it's whatever. Of course, Maximus, trick taking game. I just saw that it has a solo mode, which I don't know if it's good. I bought this game because Wanchai Moria Art, hello. It had some unique elements, but not enough to place it over other trick taking games in my collection. And like I said before, I love pretty games, but I am not a shallow person. So just because a trick-taking game has better art than some of my other trick-taking games, I'm going to choose mechanics over art every single time. 
Um, and unfortunately, this one is part of that former category. Then we have Noir. This was one of my first purchases. It's got a bunch of different games that you can play with the same cards um, and a grid of cards. It's got some deduction, some like movement, but it's a lot of back and forth. It's a lot of reading for each game that you want to play. This one is also on Board Game Arena, so if I ever want to play it again, I can just do that on there. Plottle. This one I was on the fence about purchasing. I found it for cheap and I figured I would try it because, I mean, gorgeous. I was recommended it too. There was some solo play for it, but overall it's just the drafting of the components that you're getting. You just take the ones you want. Like there's nothing inventive or interesting about that. And like you're getting sub collection bonuses, but there are no real satisfying combos or anything like that. So this one is going to be going as well. And we have Dead of Winter Flick em Up. Um, I love flicking dexterity games. This one, again, just has too many rules and too many things going on for the lighthearted nature of the game, unless you're playing it multiple times or have a group that you're playing through, like the kind of campaign stories with and going through each scenario. I had fun the one time I did get to try this one out and play it. So I'm glad that I got it when I did, but it's going to be leaving now. And then we have Roll for the Galaxy with the expansions. This is one that I played pretty early on and then bought it after playing it at a friend's. Um, I think I've just kind of outgrown this game. Again, the theme, the art, all of it don't really appeal to me. And playing it again recently at a friend's house and teaching him it, we were both like, oh yeah, well, well that's the game. Cool. All right, great. Um, I think Race for the Galaxy is a little bit more inventive with how you use the cards, although both of them I'm not the hugest fan of, so I don't think it's like I'll sell this one and pick the other one up. I think I'm just fine to play it if someone else has it, but I don't need it in my house. Princess Jing is a two-player game, and again, if I want to play an abstract game, I want to play an abstract game. Kind of gimmicky with the mirrors. I mean, I picked this one up for cheap because of the artwork. Low, yes, lovely, beautiful. But again, if I'm being honest about it, it's a pretty box with pretty components of a game that's okay that I'm never going to play. And speaking of abstract games, we have SAR. This is one of the highest range GIF games. I don't know, guys. Yinj was the first one I ever played. It's got a special place in my heart, and I've played Zerts as well, which I really love. SAR for me just is a weird combination, and I know it's not, I know that it's just that I haven't played it enough, but it feels too open. In the same way that like some people get really into chess or really into go, these wide open games, but I know that there's so many strategies and layers. Star kind of feels more in line with those than something that you can just sit down and play and understand in a couple playthroughs. I feel like this game probably takes way more to master than my brain can handle and way more time and commitment of playing the game to be able to wrap my brain around it properly. So unfortunately, this one is going to go and I'm going to just stick with the inch and Zerts. And the next one is Selenia by Pearl Games. I got this game because Gorgeous wants to do trait art. It's a pick up and deliver. Looks really cool. I like the idea of the boards that cycle through. It's just like a really light, simple game. And since getting Black Angel, that's completely replaced it for me, even though they are very different games. The chunkiness of Black Angel using similar mechanics from Selenia with like the board moving and then the ship moving forward. It just is in my mind, I would rather always play that even though it's a longer, heavier game with a lot more going on. That's the one I would go to. And if I think about Selenia, I'm going to think about Black Angel and I'm going to end up playing that instead if time allows. And that brings us to our final game here, which is Monolith Arena. And speaking of gorgeous, beautiful productions, my word. So if you're not familiar, Monolith Arena is kind of a re-implementation and reworking of Nurishima Hex. The main difference is that with your factions, you can stack them on top of each other or your different faction tiles um, on top of each other to form monoliths that will give you different benefits and you can like stack up and spread out. It's an interesting mechanic, but it feels a little bit gimmicky. I love fantasy games. My God. Oh, it's so beautiful. But yeah, the primary colors on the factions are a little eh, for me. And if I had to choose a favorite between post apocalyptic themed games and fantasy games, I would probably say fantasy is my favorite. But Nurishima Hex and just the aesthetic of it, I think, fits better with the theme that it has. Whereas this game, like the primary colors with this artwork just clash for me a little bit too much. And there's more context for Nurishima Hex. I've already committed to buying all of it forever. I don't think I need a second game that's super similar that I'm going to be buying all the content for it forever, unfortunately. 
So of the two, Nurushima Hex 1, Monolith Arena, although it's a really cool game, although it's got really cool implementation and that update of having the Monolith stacked, I'm not going to be playing it, let's be honest. Every other time, I would rather play Nurushima Hex and explore some of the factions there. So it is what it is. So there you have it. That is some number of games <laughs> that I'm going to be pulling from my collection. I'm not quite sure. I lost track. Maybe you can let me know in the comments down below. It's always a bittersweet thing, letting go of games, because at some point there was something about that game that drew you to it in the first place, whether it was the art, the designer, the publisher, the theme, the mechanics, the implementation, just being able to be honest and walk away from that. These are games that I maybe don't need. It's such a great part of the hobby to have so much variety, to have so much choice, to have so much different representation to where each individual person can go through and be like, yeah, these are all good games, but this game is special to me. Letting go of these other games, I don't know. I would like to think that they're going to homes where they will be just as special to someone else as my games that I'm keeping are to me. But that's all the time we have for today. If you enjoyed the video, please feel free to give it a like. It really helps out the channel and helps this video get out to a wider audience. And if you really enjoyed it, you can also subscribe down below for more board game content. And if you click the little bell button, you'll be notified every time I release a new video. Thank you so much for being here and for joining me. It's so good to be back and I will see you very soon next time. Bye. I don't know. Mm, that's what she said. <laughs>